your next speaker and talk, um, Ben Johnson, who is the CTO and co-founder of Obsidian Security. So I've known Ben for a couple of years now, and uh, Ben's been all over the place, right? So Ben's done a lot of really interesting work in his career. And so he uh, was one of the original founders of uh, a little company some of you guys might have heard of called Carbon Black uh, way back in the day. He's done some other really interesting uh, sort of work in the technical industry, mostly, you know, oriented towards security and defense. And at some point, and Ben, you'll have to just, you know, you know, bear with me. I don't know when you decided that cloud was going to be the move for you, man. But uh, he has shifted gears and is focused on a lot of really interesting problems out there, particularly around the world of SaaS. And that's what he's going to be talking to you guys about now. So Ben, take it away, man. All right. Uh, thanks, Shaq. And uh... You, you can all hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Sound good. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so thanks to everybody uh, for allowing me to present. Uh, Lily and Melissa, great, uh, great talk. Happy to, to go after you. And uh, Shaq, great, great talk this morning. Um, I just want to say, too, to the whole SANS crew, like this has been awesome in terms of how, how the logistics work. Like I really like the way you're using Slack and the different rooms. And, you know, of course, we're probably all doing a lot of different virtual events. And, and I think you're really at the top of, of what I've seen in terms of communication and, and, and the different Slack rooms and things like that. So, so good job. Not that you need my my kudos or anything, but I just want to call out that, that it's been really cool having these uh, different ways to communicate. So anyways, uh, enough said. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Jack. And uh, let me see if I get this work in here. Um, and okay. Uh, so, uh, real quick, I mean, uh, you, you heard a brief introduction. Uh, really, I got my start in, uh, in the intelligence community, NSA, and then a bunch of actually different uh, Intelligence community organizations, uh, it was awesome. I would have done it for free, but they paid us. Uh, really uh, both sides of the ball, so to speak, and uh, just, just some really cool stuff as, a, as an intrusion engineer. Uh, and then we ended up doing uh, incident response. And during that time frame, uh, it was really, you know, exploding around uh, Operation Aurora and maybe more like uh, awareness around nation states and things like that. And so uh, we ended up coming up with the idea for Carbon Black and, and sort of continuous monitoring, continuous recording of endpoints. Uh, that was a great run. And in that journey, I probably met some of you and, and went really around the world, 100 flights a year globally, and, uh, and saw that company go from, from basically the two of us to uh, 800, and now it's part of VMware and, and you know, massive. Um, and I, I got a lot of good opportunities to learn. Like, so I've been a technologist, a computer scientist, a security geek uh, for you know, pretty much 20 years now. Uh, but I also got to interact with just so many amazing you know, tech companies, manufacturing, energy, financial, uh, retail, uh, government agencies, et cetera. So I got to absorb a lot of information too. Uh, and, uh, and then I said, you know, cloud is, is the future, right? Like uh, sounds, sounds dumb when I say it like that, uh, but you know, Shaq bringing it up, um, you know, what's going on in terms of cloud security and, and what's happening and I uh, wanted to build something new. And so that's where Obsidian is. We do, we do cloud detection and response. Um, and uh, so I think about threats. I think about mistakes. I think about, about leaking, uh, and really how to prevent all that uh, pretty much all the time, right, in terms of, uh, in terms of cloud and, and even more specifically SaaS. One other thing, too, is I miss the national security mission. So uh, I'm an advisor to the U.S. FISA court. <clears throat> Actually, Rob Lee from, from, uh, from, from your SANS team is, is also there with me. If you're not following, there's a lot of news around FISA court, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, so anyways, enough about me. I just want to know where, you're, where I'm coming from. And uh, what I like to do when I give a talk is throw a ton at you. And so you're going to just see a lot, a lot of different information. Hopefully most of it's practical, but there is some sort of philosophical and, and kind of high level approach information too. Um, and I just want you to feel like the time was well spent, right? Um, and uh, so it looks like a little bit of a, uh, of an of a, of a interesting title issue here. Um, but basically what the title is supposed to say is cloud is accelerating business. Uh, not sure what happened, but, uh, but no, no sweat. Cloud is accelerating business. Um, and really, it, you know, security teams, our, our job is to enable business to advance, but do it in a safe way, right? Do it in a, in a secure, to overuse that term, secure way. Uh, and to quote this cool guy, Dave Shackelford, 75% um, of the cloud is SaaS. And so um, I tend to get a little bit frustrated uh, when, when you say the term cloud and even this summit, right? 
most people's mind go to IaaS, and that's okay, but like th there's 75% of what we're doing in terms of quote unquote cloud is not IaaS, right? And you know, sort of pick your, your statistics or whatever, but um, we can't ignore this, right? And so, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't have SaaS, it's coming. I'm sure everyone here has some sort of SaaS. Gmail, <laughs> Office 365, you're using Zoom. Uh, for crying out loud, <laughs> um, but it's here, right? And, uh, and 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 it's only accelerating. I've talked to companies that have 800 SaaS apps. I don't know what you all have, but it's here, right? Um, and you know, uh, I think one thing that we forget to talk about sometimes, and uh, I do think there was maybe a little bit of this discussion earlier this morning in either some of Shaq's uh, sort of. Uh, uh, examples and, and, and sort of case studies or uh, with what Melissa and Lily were talking about. But, you know, clouds talk to clouds. So it's not just the adversaries. It's not just our users. Then we have all the API integrations, the third party OAuth apps. We have sometimes very tight integrations, for example, between G Suite and Salesforce or whatever, where you can literally create events that are called G Suite, you know, whatever inside Salesforce. Um, so there's just a lot of access and data is flying all over the place, right? And so we have to think about SaaS and we have to think about what's going on here. Now, I'm not going to beat this to death. This is probably the 15th time this morning you've heard the word shared responsibility, but you know, SaaS is still our responsibility. Um, and when we think about it, it's, yeah, they do a lot of the work for us, right? You're not worried as, as much about like Linux vulnerabilities and stuff like that. And sorry that I have this like logo sort of showing up here if you're, if you're seeing video. Um, but there's still a lot of like, who has access to SaaS? What are they doing in that access? What are they sharing? Are the settings correct? Are the behaviors correct? You know, so you have to understand what's going on. And with SaaS especially, often it's your entire employee population that's using it, which let's be honest, you're gonna have a lot of people that aren't super technical. Maybe in IaaS, you can restrict it to more engineers and production, you know, DevOps and things like that, which we all know still make tons of mistakes with security. We all, like I make tons of mistakes too. Um, but when you talk about SaaS, now you have an even, you know, broader range of skill sets of people using these, these tools. So just something that makes it even more challenging in some ways, right? Um, so when we think about this, uh, cloud security being a priority, um, and let me build this out here. Um, you know, your companies are going to SaaS. Your adversaries then are thinking about SaaS. Your users are using it, so therefore mistakes are happening. Uh, and if you think about like some of these SaaS providers, like Salesforce literally calls out that you need to be doing audits of behavior, audits of activity, looking for potential fraud and abuse, right? Um, and so we have these always on, always reachable targets. We have user populations that are challenging through oversharing, over authorization, right? Um, what I found is there's not a whole lot of expertise in cloud detection or in like what we should care about, which is why I think everyone's at a, at a summit like this. And I'm sure we have people that are early in your cloud journey all the way to you know, hardcore experts that could teach me all day long. Um, but we have a very broad skill set. And I think cloud is so much newer than network security, host based security, that we're still catching up. And when I talk to companies, you know, they're, they're like, what, 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 are, what should I care about? Like, I, I sort of know IOCs now for on prem or for network monitoring or, you know, EDR or something like that. Um, but what should I care about? Right. And so we have this, this gap often. And then we all know the whole like provision and forget, like you give access to somebody and you'd never want them to come back and bug you. So often we all have way too much access. Uh, and then there's all these logs all over the place. And you heard a bit about, um, I actually wrote some quotes down from, from, from Lily and Ms. Melissa, but um, there's all these different logs and like, how do you look at them and how do you pull them and you know, stuff like that. I think I even have some, some, some quotes from Shaq, but I've picked on him enough uh, about that. Um, and so when we think about this security it's really the same. There is some differences, but it's really the same because we're trying to allow the business to advance its mission, right? Um, and we want the business to utilize these tools that were adopted for productivity, for cost savings, to help with innovation, right? That's why they're going. That's why all of our businesses or our customers' businesses are going to these, these platforms because they want 
better efficiency. They want better productivity and innovation. And so if you hurt these, you are literally working against the entire business. So you can't slow them down. You can't really, you know, prevent them from, from utilizing them for the purposes they were adopted or are moving to for. Uh, but when you think about it, what do we want? We want to review and monitor access. We want to review and monitor privilege. We want to look at configurations and we want to understand behavior. So that's not really different. If you talk to someone on the network side or trying to monitor HQ or look at everyone's endpoints, it's really not that different. But yet you don't really control a lot of these systems, right? How do you do detection on someone else's you know, stack? Or how do you do incident response when you have to reach in and grab the logs either on demand or figure out all these different logs and things like that? So there are a lot of challenges, even though at the core of it, we're basically trying to do the same thing. So, um, you know, security's aim for cloud, uh, really protect, detect, respond, right? Uh, Pick, pick your framework, pick NIST, pick whatever. Um, but we want to understand and protect account access. We want to enable, you know, responsible use, responsible collaboration. I think the word enable needs to be very much part of our you know, sort of vernacular, or our day-to-day -day, uh, communications, because we're here, we are here to enable, right? Um, and then we still have a job to do. So we need to detect, detect mistakes, detect abuse, detect adversaries, uh, and then be able to investigate and clean up, right? And so really, again, not that different. And a quote I always uh, sort of talk about and steal from a TED talk that has nothing to do with cybersecurity, uh, which is really talking about real disease, um, is the absence of disease does not mean health. And I think in security, and you could talk about cloud security, um, just because you're not getting that call from Brian Krebs, uh, and by the way, one of my buddies called me one day, he's like, hey, I, uh, I get a call from, uh, from Brian Krebs, is this guy legit? And my heart sank. I was like, crap, you guys are not in a good place. Anyways, um, but just because you're not getting that call, does that mean you're healthy or not, right? Let's be honest, it doesn't confirm health. It might say you're maybe not bleeding out right now, if you can detect that. Uh, but anyways, um, we have to get better at just really trying to, to improve, even if we're not on the, on the front page of, you know, pick your, your newspaper. So um, I figured I would talk a bit about some SaaS detection things to think about. Um, we obviously don't have a lot of time. I've already been rambling quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to go a little quick here and just give you some things to think about. Happy to talk more in Slack after, happy to connect on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, or, you know, email or whatever too. Um, but really, you know, when we think about detection, the first goal is often adversaries. Like, is there anyone from the outside trying to get in? There's plenty of other things to worry about. But first and foremost are you know, pick your adversarial country or your adversarial group or whatever, are they getting in? Business email compromise, whatever it is. Um, so you want to figure out that. Then you want to think about privileged activity because that is keys to the kingdom, right? Uh, I think the sort of security 101, but you want to understand like, what are my privileged users doing in Slack or G Suite or Office 365 or Box or Zoom or whatever, right? Um, and then you need to think about, okay, so then what are my users doing? Maybe accidentally, could be malicious, but what are they doing accidentally? Like, Exposing S3 buckets, again, as you just heard, or, or oversharing, you know, G Suite files, et cetera. Um, and then I think you want to look at surface area. How is the surface area changing? Is there a whole bunch of new users added? Is there some settings change that completely blows open the surface area? You know, that kind of thing. And then finally, insider threats, which, which are incredibly difficult to detect uh, because they have legitimate access. Uh, they probably know something about how you defend your environment. Um, and, you know, you, but you need to be thinking about these, especially if you're an IP heavy company where, you know, someone could literally take your formulas, your blueprints, your, your code, go to your competitor or, you know, whatever purpose. So um, some things to think about there. Now, if you look at like Office 365, for an example, they try to make some of the information, uh, you know, exposed. So you go in, you have some logs, um, you can start to see like who's logging in, what IP they're logging in, you can do some searching, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's okay, right? And I'm trying to call out some of these native capabilities so you don't have to go out and buy something. Um, of course, there's tools available and such, but, you know, there are some native capabilities here. And so if you go in, you can see where people are logging in from. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I don't really understand these IP addresses. Like to me, they're just numbers. It's hard for me to memorize all these different IPs among all the other things I'm doing. Um, and so how do, I, how do I think about that? Now, again, there are some good things here where if I click on it, I get some context and stuff like that. Um, and I can do some searching, but uh, it's, it's, it's not great. So you need to start thinking about how am I gonna look at you know, logins and, and, and that kind of thing. 
Now, if I compare it with G Suite, um, Office 365 actually has the edge up here because G Suite has even less context, right? They do have some useful information and they are investing, both these companies are investing in some native security tooling uh, and a little bit better UIs, but I'll say their, their security portions of their UIs are still leaving a lot to be desired. Um, so you can really see like somebody logged in with, with Google or maybe some other, I mean, with a password or maybe some other methods. Um, it's okay, it's not, it, it's not great, but at least you can start to get some understanding of, of kind of what's going on and who's failing, you know, maybe looking more at the failures here. Now, Salesforce, um, Salesforce has a lot of issues <laughs> and I'm not gonna beat up Salesforce too bad, but they're just such a massive app, massive tool that it's incredibly complicated. Um, but one thing they do very well is they actually try to geolocate the IPs and tell you how you're logging in, like which application or, or that kind of thing. Um, but the cool thing is I can much more quickly say, hey, wait, why was this login from you know, some continent that I don't even have people on? Uh, that makes a lot more sense to me than an IP address, right? So there is some better context there that you can go into their UI and detect, right? So I do like some of these aspects of, of being able to call this stuff out. Now, what should you care about when it comes to logins? And again, I know we have a breadth or broad audience here. So some of this might be, oh, wow, this is really cool. And some of you are like, yeah, this is, this is like, I, I, I know all this stuff. So, you know, hopefully you're, you're all taking something away here, but, um, you know, I think if you if you don't have a lot of time or you don't have a lot of expertise, you know, start with your admins. Again, kind of privileged users, you know, some core security concepts, but when are your admins logging in from? When are they logging in and where are they logging in from? And then if you can start to spread that out and looking for unusual login locations across your user population, that's a pretty good indicator, right? Um, not, not gonna say that alone will confirm, uh, you know, compromise, but, you need to understand where people are logging in from. And if Ben, me, and I'm always in California and all of a sudden I'm logging in from Holland or you know, Greece or eight, somewhere in Asia, that's pretty weird, right? Um, and then spikes and failed logins, right? You wanna get ahead of the problem. So if you can get ahead of the problem and try to figure out, wait, why is this person being targeted? Or are they being targeted? You know, that kind of thing. Um, you can at least say, hey, wait, they're being targeted and they don't have MFA right now or whatever, right? Just helps you get better context. Um, and then, you know, maybe who's coming after you or who's targeting you, IP or geolocations that are targeting many users, you know, password sprays, credential stuffing, really trying to get in through any means necessary. Um, you get to look at that stuff, right? Now, continuing on. Um, another thing you really need to keep an eye on is privilege changes or access changes, right? And so in Office 365, you could search for who's getting added to different roles, different groups. And if you go and look at these uh, screens, you can actually get some context. Now, it might be a little bit messy in this big JSON blob, but you can at least go in and look and see which, you know, which user basically modified another user's privileges, granted them more privileges or, or removed them, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Because, you know, especially all of a sudden you get a brand new global admin in Office 365, which you can basically, basically do anything. That's a huge event. Maybe it's completely legit, but that's a huge event. So you really need to be looking for uh, privilege changes. And it can be incremental. You don't have to necessarily wait until they get maximum sort of root privileges. Um, you know, someone gets a little bit more and more privilege. Now, all of a sudden they can, you know, add other users or they can access certain new apps within Office 365 and that kind of thing. So just need to keep an eye on that. And, um, whoops, looks like it's a theme having some of these uh, clicking issues. Um, okay, so um, uh, in G Suite, they actually do give you some, some pretty cool context here where people are added to roles or given certain uh, licenses and that kind of thing. So you can go in and get some, some maybe better intel here and they even have some alerts. You can have the alerts set up automatically to just, just come to you. Now, if you're doing what, what I would recommend, which is having separate admin and user accounts for yourself, um, the alerts are probably just gonna to go to your admin account. And if you're not using that for email, which is smart, um, you're gonna to have to figure out how to get those alerts to you. But the point is they have some information in here. You can get a handle on how the surface area, especially around privileged users is changing. Um, and you know, I would keep an eye on that because that, that is so critical. And even if you have 100,000 employees, you probably only have 10, 50, 100 maybe privileged users in, in Office or G Suite. If you have more than that, you might want to question your, your grants. <laughs> um, but the point is you can look at this stuff and, uh, and really get a good sense of, of kind of how the privileged uh, surface area is changing. 
Uh, let me just do a time check here. Cool. Um, so uh, what should you care about, right? So certainly new privileges granted uh, because people can do more, right? Adversaries in, they've compromised an account, and all of a sudden they get more privileges, they can do more, insider can do more. Uh, completely legitimate, proper person that gets new privileges, now that their mistakes have bigger ramifications, bigger blast radius, right? So uh, new admins, new roles being added, et cetera, just need to keep an eye on that. Um, you also wanna keep an eye on removal of privileged access. I've seen major companies where they literally got down to only one user had sort of global admin uh, in Azure for all of production. And they were like, oh man, if that person <laughs> gets hit by a bus or goes in the hospital or quits or whatever, we could be really, really hurting. So there's part of it could be malicious, but part of it's just sort of business continuity and, and, and thinking about you know removal of privileged access. And the other things too is it's not just about your account literally getting bumped up to a new privilege level. If you get specific grants like mailbox delegation, that's where maybe you can read, you know, I've seen university deans where all of a sudden a bunch of people get granted access to the dean's mailbox. And now they're not logging in as the dean, but they're getting access to the mail. Um, and they can read the mail and that kind of thing, which could, you know, provide insights. And especially if you're a corporation doing mergers, you can do all sorts of insider trading on certain information, right? So you just have to keep an eye on that stuff. Um, and then can you correlate all that to a source of truth, like an HR system? Like if you're using Workday or some of these other HR systems as really your source of truth for people, when you see a new user in G Suite or Office or Box or whatever, can you correlate that back and say, wait, this person doesn't even exist. It's a fake account or whatever. Um, and then finally, like, sort of the hidden threat, maybe it's not hidden, maybe you all think about this, is contractors, consultants, MSSPs, they go in and the first thing they do is add like four global admins in office because they're monitoring your Office 365. Maybe that's okay, but now your surface area is exploding and then they switch or they rotate out people or whatever and you just continue to get this sort of bloat or creep around access. Um, that's pretty damaging. And we've seen, uh, you know, it could be Salesforce accounts that are uh, uh, a contractor uh, who came in or uh, an outside counsel who came in like three years ago, they still have system administrator rights in Salesforce, but they haven't logged in in two years. So like we, we've seen a lot of um, sort of failures around cleanup. Uh, so keep an eye on, you know, contractors and consultants and that kind of thing. Um, and then when you look at admin activity, you know, you're trying to figure out like what are admins actually doing? So not just changes to admin privilege or you know, privileged access. Um, but what are admins actually doing? You can actually typically call these out in something like G Suite where you can say, just show me all my admin activity, you basically get a report. You could even share that with the admin and say, hey, did you do all this stuff? Just want you to know. Um, or you can have sort of other oversight and that kind of thing. But if nothing else, you're, you're logging it, you're looking at, you know, kind of what's going on uh, from the privileged users, which should be a small amount of your work if, you know, if, if users are, are really using their accounts for, you know, user level purposes. Um, and in Box and Dropbox, uh, you can do similar. You can say, show me all the privileged activity. The things I don't like in these systems are that you have to know what to look for. So in Google, you can basically say, show me all admin activity. In Box and Dropbox, you have to actually come in and say, like, I want to check all these boxes because all of these are basically privileged events. Then, you know, give me the report. Um, and so uh, it is a little bit extra work, but the cool thing is you can go in and see what the admins in these apps are doing. And by the way, I should have said this like 15 minutes ago or whenever I started, one of my biggest surprises in this now my, my job now, which is, you know, focused on, on cloud security and, and often SaaS, um, is how disconnected the security teams typically are from the application owner. So you have the Salesforce owner, the, the Workday owner, the Office 365 owner. Security is like over here. And I, I don't think it's that different from AWS where there's often engineering or production owns that and security has to sort of sometimes beg quite literally for access. Uh, but in SaaS, it's, it's, it's often even worse because sometimes those SaaS apps aren't even part of IT. And so security and maybe even IT have to figure out how to get access. So if you do get access, you might wanna have security doing oversight of the admin activities. Again, maybe not for malicious purposes, maybe for malicious purposes or, or concerns, um, but just to make sure like people aren't changing your security posture or some of that uh, accidentally or making other mistakes, right? So um, really security needs to try to get some of this access. Um, I'm gonna stick to the keyboard. Whoop. I think it's still going forward, let's see. 
Sorry about that. Um, okay. So uh, the other thing I think about is, uh, and, and I think we all think about this, is broadly shared files, right? Um, we use a lot of these tools to collaborate, to share, to use them for, you know, maybe documents or, or files and that kind of thing. Um, but a lot of times it's easy to overshare. You accidentally share it with the whole uh, company. Okay, that's probably not good, but at least it's within your company. You overshare it with the whole internet. Okay, that's maybe not not good. Uh, you send people links that are anonymous links and then they add other people to the thread and next thing you know all these other people can just click that link and there's no password or no you know accounts required or anything. Um, so you can look in places like G Suite and try to understand like who is sharing uh, files. In fact you can even say hey tell me any files that changed from internal only to external visibility meaning someone outside either a specific person or maybe anyone with the link that kind of thing can come in. So uh, really, uh, I think that's a good area to to focus on, especially if you've done like single sign-on and multi-factor authentication, you're probably not going to get compromised that much, right? I mean, that's the loaded statement and probably a whole talk in itself. But if you do MFA right and you do SSO correct, then you're more concerned about from the inside out, like what you're sharing and, you know, similar to like the S3 buckets and stuff like that, like oversharing. Uh, but the cool thing is some of these tools, you can go in and actually see what's what's going on. Um, the other thing, this is sort of the, 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 the really hidden threat here, which is OAuth or third party apps. So what, if you're not familiar with this, you know, you, you, you add a app to Slack or you sign into a website and say, log in using my Gmail account or my Google, you know, G Suite account or Office account. Um, and you often grant some scopes. Now it might just be your identity, like verifying your email, but it could be like full Google Drive access. So now all of a sudden you grant Google Drive access to some, you know, uh, less trusted app, let's say, and then every file in your company is by default shared within the domain. So someone shares a file with everyone, they're also actually sharing it with this app that's shady, right? So um, you need to be very careful here. And the one thing to note is there's a huge number of attacks going on with OAuth apps because it makes MFA basically irrelevant. If I send you a link and say, you're invited to this awesome new Google Drive 2.0 uh, experience where you, everything's much better or whatever, and you click it, you're already signed into your account. And then you're authorizing that app grants. So that user, you know, the person that's driving that doesn't need to log into your account, doesn't need to go through your MFA or trick you to put your MFA tokens in. So. OAuth is a huge risk. Now it's a huge value. There's a lot of value there too. Uh, but just keeping in mind, there's all these different OAuth apps out there. You know, you, you add um, Google Calendar to Slack and all these other things, right? I mean, we all do it. Um, but the point is go in and look at what's going on and who's granting access to these and who's granting sensitive access. And a lot of these different tools, some of them it's pretty hard to find, but, but they often do expose, like here's, here's the applications that are getting access to, you know, to, to your accounts or your APIs. And you know, just something to think about. Now, when you, when you think about these, um, you need to worry about sensitive scopes, sensitive grants, like full mail access, full, full drive access, um, sharing externally with no expiration or no password or restrictions. Um, really need to think about everything having a half-life, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, system level apps that are granted access to all accounts, uh, where if I authorize this app as an admin, it can actually access everyone's account. Sometimes that's needed, but just be careful about that. And then maybe an app that has sensitive access and out of 100,000 employees or 5,000 or whatever, only one user has installed it. You probably want to at least look at that. It's probably violating some policy or maybe it's malicious. Now, let's see here. Let's see if I can do this. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think I have about 10 minutes, so let me go a little quick here. So I just want to call out what we do internally, like as, as our internal security, because one thing I think we don't do enough of is share lessons learned uh, among the community. We might share uh, threat intel, we might share some attacks and things, but like, what does your team do for security? And this is a very brief introduction, uh, but we're a you know, sort of modern company, three years old, so we basically have MacBook Pros and SaaS and IS, that's it. Um, we're worried about threats and excessive risk, but we want to say yes to the business. Uh, we enable auditing on SaaS applications. 
we pull telemetry into our own product. Uh, you could, you know, connect up to, to Splunk, Snowflake, et cetera, like a data lake. Uh, we enable CloudTrail. You heard some, some, some of that before, like you really need to monitor. Um, we try to do everything through geo enrichment so we can put a physical location to an IP address. Not 100% accurate, but it's, it's pretty good. We try to send everything to Slack as our core, like alerts go there. Um, Dart duty, I, I misspelled Macy, um, our own product we use, we use Carbon Black on our endpoints. Um, and then what we do is we, we use that in our Slack to look at alerts and then we pivot to the domain specific tool, right? If it's SaaS, we might go to our tool. If it's endpoint, go to Carbon Black. If it's uh, maybe uh, IaaS, we might go directly to the, the cloud provider like AWS. Um, and then we correlate usually based on the user, like the identity or IP. Uh, and then our analysts, our security team doesn't need production access if the right data is flowing, right? If the right alerts and the right data is flowing, they, don't, they might not even need production access which is great because you want to keep security out of production if you can, right? Um, just so the fewer people that have production access, the better. Now I mentioned security needs insight and oversight. Um, and if nothing else, they need access. But if you can get them what they need to do their job, what we all need to do our job. Um, and then we try to turn review tasks into alert tasks. So if you can say up till today, everything's good. Then every day you just analyze the delta, analyze the change and then alert if something goes worse or the trend gets worse or something violates policy, then you're never really having to do these massive access reviews and stuff. You're just trying to, you know, analyze every small change quickly and you're always kind of caught up like as of, you know, May 25th or J June 1st or whatever, everything's good. And we know all change going forward. Now it's a little bit of a, of a dream there, but uh, you know, I think we do a pretty good job of that. Now, um, a few things to focus on and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you be on your way and hopefully you took something away from this. Um, make access have a half-life. Don't say, hey, you have access, done. It's like, no, 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 you have access and if I don't do anything else, that will go away in 30 days or 365 days or whatever it is. Too often we think of it as you either have access or don't rather than having a half-life that's decaying and eventually if I do nothing, I'll be in a better default place come again, three months from now or whatever. Um, and, and tools like Slack, when you invite a guest or a new user, you can literally set a time limit, which is awesome. And Slack's been doing a, a lot of really good things uh, around security. Do it, set a time limit, set the end of the quarter and you have to review it. And they, by the way, they'll ping you and say, this guy's account is about to expire. Do you want to extend it? And all you have to do is literally click yes. And it'll give it a couple more weeks or whatever. So uh, make access have a half-life. Lock down what you can. Right, if you can create a single sign-on, like a single choke point, everything's going through there, then you can maybe pump those logs into whatever you wanna monitor, maybe do IP geo enrichment, et cetera. Um, when someone leaves, you can cut it off there. You might have to do some other cleanup, but you know, create single sign-on choke points. Uh, create separate admin accounts. Don't do your day-to-day -day stuff with admin privileges. That's just not good. Um, there's a lot of built-in settings you can use to like disable mail forwarding, require passwords when you send invites. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of the Zoom stuff lately. Like you can set a button that says every, or click a, click a setting that says every Zoom invite needs a password. Like just do it. And the team will have to adjust, you know, do some communication and coaching and stuff. Um, and then watch out for things like OAuth, linking accounts across, uh, you know, apps and that kind of thing, API attacks, where are people creating API tokens using you know, scripts and that kind of thing? You see Python as a user agent and stuff like that. So really try to lock down what you can. And then um, you know, collect telemetry. And again, I'm, I'm sort of harping on <laughs> previous talks, but like, you need visibility. You need to understand what's going on. Like, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, uh, sort of the sales mantra of always be closing. Well, I actually wrote down, I don't know if it was Lily or Melissa who said it, but it's basically like always be monitoring, right? <laughs> like, so always be monitoring um, and get telemetry, whether you're pumping it directly into a SIM, a data lake, uh, some other kind of tool, whether you're using some of these SDKs or uh, sample code to go reach out and pull the data yourself and, and sort of massage it. Do, do whatever you need to do, but there's tools out there. Get telemetry. You're going to need it for any sort of IR. It's going to help with compliance and then just day-to-day -day monitoring and getting ahead of threats, right? And then uh, make it easy for your users to do the right thing. Give them what they need. And sometimes they want things they don't need and you, you have to give them that. Um, and if you have a low pain process to approve new stuff, the users will do the right thing. 
If you make it hard to get approval, they will never give up access, right? One of my buddies is a, a trader at a huge Wall Street firm. He's like, we all always say yes to we need these <laughs> accounts because we know it'll take six months to get them back if we, if we give them up. Um, so make it easier to get stuff, which then therefore makes people more comfortable giving up access they don't need. Um, and if you're a user, an engineer, an individual contributor, like consider security when you're working, consider privacy, productivity, as we talked about, and then, you know, go through the processes that you've established. Um, and then, you know, make your teams own it. With 800 SaaS apps, you have to have the business owner, basically the data owner, care. Whoever brought in that SaaS app needs to understand how they can get some help from security, some oversight, some reviews, but ultimately, if they're going to own it, they need to actually do that, own it. Um, and then really make sure they can enable uh, or make sure you enable integrations into authentication, logging, et cetera. Um, continuously provide guidance, you know, monitor, pen test, all the things that, that should be happening. Um, and I do think this is a huge opportunity for us to un unify cloud, uh, via cloud, unify IT and security, appropriate tech, appropriate risk. Um, you know, I have heard that we're creating the same problems in 10 days that we took 10 years to create on-prem uh, when it comes to cloud. So we have to really understand we can get better really fast or we can get worse really fast. So we need to, to think about that. Um, and really, and I gave a whole talk just basically on this slide at B-Sides Augusta last year, which you can go find on YouTube. But really, this is all you can do. You can slow attackers down or you can speed defenders up or ideally both. And in the middle is basically, can you sort of coach, manipulate, <laughs> guide your employee population, your user population toward good choices, good behavior, or discourage bad choices, bad behavior. So really, this is all you can do. This is security in one slide, right? And, and feel free to debate me on this, but this is security in one slide, what you can do. And ideally, you can do parts of all this, but you kind of have to pick where you're going to go, right? And, and you can almost see like prevention on the left and detection response on the right. And, you know, SaaS is not going away uh, with 18 employees. Some of the statistics are that you probably already have 81 SaaS apps, 18 employees, 81 SaaS apps. So we got to think about this. And to quote a, a CISO I recently talked to, the journey is going to end in SaaS, right? We're trying to get more and more away from owning IT, from owning compute, you know, serverless computing. We're going to have... AWS and Azure and GCP and IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, every pick your cloud. We're going to have, from an IaaS perspective, we're going to have that for a while, but we're all trying to get out of the business of doing things that aren't really making us money. Um, and so the journey is going to end in SaaS. So uh, with that, thank you very much. Happy to chat on Slack or over other mediums. And uh, Shaq and everyone, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ben. What a great uh chunk of wisdom you've imparted to us. We do have a couple uh, questions from both Slack as well as the Zoom portal. The first one from Zoom is from Vikram. Can't you limit the scope of OAuth tokens so that they can't be misused by malicious links or apps? Yeah, uh, so, uh, so, so the question is, uh, I, I mean, this is Zoom, so I think everyone heard it, but <laughs> I'm used to being on stage and like repeating the question. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can you limit OAuth app scopes? Yes and no. Um, sometimes in the SaaS application, you can say don't allow someone to install an OAuth app that has this scope. That's sometimes. Now, also what you're gonna run into, it's similar to like whitelisting on an endpoint. Like that works in theory until all of a sudden the executive or you know, the high paid consultant or something needs to install an app that needs that scope. Often you can't be super granular where you can say just this person can install this scope. At least we haven't moved that far yet with, with sort of SaaS controls and stuff like that. So good, 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 good angle. Like, yeah, try to reduce whatever scopes that can be prevented from being granted. But in reality, I think it's, it's pretty hard to do that. Okay, great. Uh, Charisma asks, instead of alerts going to Slack, why are you orchestrating these alerts to collect all the data from these tools and present in a single pane of glass to be worked? Yeah, um, I think, so we already 
live and die in Slack as a company, just as in terms of communication. And so we're already getting human requests in Slack. We're getting operational alerts of things going down or things getting slow in terms of a infrastructure component or whatever in Slack. And so our alerts going to Slack is just that that same sort of single pane of 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 notification, we'll call it, for anything sort of company related. Um, yeah, I think we want to get to a place where we on demand pull even more telemetry and put it somewhere. Uh, and we've done some work there. But um, often, like, you, you just want to be notified. And then if you can hop into the tool that's going to present the data much better, right, like the endpoint tool is going to present the endpoint process tree. Whereas if I shove it into a big sim or something it's it's probably just rows of data which is fine but like it's not as ideal and so you're probably going to be pivoting anyways and at this point we're we're okay with having to hop into different tools and a lot of times you look at the alert and you really don't have to go anywhere so um long story short yeah i think we'll continue to evolve and figure out what data to pull where and how much to use a soar or a sim or other tools uh but so far it's been working pretty well yeah and i think that's really the key isn't it is what works for your company right Another question uh, from Michael, uh, are there any good models for SaaS test tenants? This seems to vary from provider to provider and what they support. For example, with O365, you can create a second managed domain with test users. But with Zoom, you might need to purchase another 10 enterprise uh, users. Is there any good practices that you can share with us? So, I think the the I think it was Michael or whomever asked the question. Um, I, I think you hit it spot on in terms of the pain point. There's some progress there. I don't think it's been great. I think most. Uh, so so I'll give you two quick stories, and I know we're we're starting to run out of time here. But um, the first is when we deal with a customer and they have like a QA or a test environment for different SaaS apps. Um, it seems like a lot of times they have to generate data themselves via scripts or, you know, some sort of process, right? Like maybe it's 0365, there's like PowerShell scripts trying to generate data and stuff like that. Um, and we see that quite often. And then with our own stuff, we need to understand a bunch of SaaS apps just for what we do in our business. And we've had to go in and buy, just like the question said, different instances of all these different apps and then create fake users and try to automate uh, generating realistic data and stuff like that. So I think to your question, um, I have not really seen anything that makes this easier. Um, there's a little bit maybe within certain SaaS apps, but it's usually not what's being invested in. Usually it's first and foremost, like the, the prime functionality like document sharing or Zoom or whatever. The second functionality is security, which is usually lagging. And then the third would be like all these other sort of enterprise grade capabilities, which are even further behind. 